Well, good afternoon. How is everyone? Did you have an excellent lunch? Good. Well, hopefully you didn't eat too much so you start to nod off because we've got a fascinating session coming up. We're going to be talking about dry farming. And I'm going to let the folks explain what that means. But let me introduce you. We've got a trio of folks that are going to be talking to us about this. Amy Garrett has been working with the OSU Extension Small Farms Program in the Southern Willamette Valley for 20 years in the horticultural industry, doing everything from landscape design, installation and maintenance to organic farming research and education. Her special interests are in organic crop production, season extension, permaculture design and dry farming, drought mitigation tools and strategies for growing with little or no irrigation have become a focus in her work. The dry farming project she is leading has expanded over the past several years from case studies and demonstrations to a multifaceted participatory research project with 30 trial hosts in the Dry Farming Collaborative in 2018. That's Amy. And Teresa, I'm going to say your name wrong, so Retzlaff. An opportunity to pursue her passion for organic farming led Teresa to the North Oregon coast in 2003 where she joined a growing community of small farms and local food enthusiasts. She and her husband, Packy Coleman, began farming on loose land and selling through regional farmers markets. In 2009, they acquired land in Olney near Astoria and began 46 North Farm. They grow produce, cut flowers, and plant starts and only a few of their 18 acres, gently managing the rest for wildlife and pollinator habitat. The farm sells seasonally through the Astoria Co-op Grocery, a small community-supported agriculture program, and to many restaurants. Teresa is a strong advocate for the importance of local food and small farms to the Lower Columbia Pacific region, speaking about gardening, farming, and growing food at educational events, and through her twice-monthly radio show, In Season on Coast, Community Radio KMUN Astoria 91.9 FM, if you're ever in the area. Since 2015, she has participated in Oregon State University's Dry Farming Collaborative, helping to increase understanding about how to grow crops without irrigation. She also sits on the advisory committee for OSU Center for Small Farms and Community Food Systems. Awesome. And last but not least is Lucas Niebert, a USDA, did I say that wrong? Oh, gosh, I got lucky a USDA NEFA postdoctoral fellow at Oregon State University. Dr. Niebert is researching the use of microbial inoculants to enhance drought tolerance of diverse crops. Working jointly with the microbiology laboratory of Dr. Cozy Busby and the Dry Farming Collaborative via OSU Small Farms Extension, he hopes to integrate the latest plant microbiome research with the knowledge and needs of farmers to innovate for a more drought resilient agriculture. Dr. Niebert has focused his career on fundamental and applied soil and microbial, bleh, soil and plant microbial ecology, earning an MS in soil quality at a University of the Netherlands <laughs> and a PhD in environmental science. Two pages. And studies and policy at University of Oregon in 2018. He also works with Moondogs Farm in Marcola, Oregon, which experiments with dry farming methods and produces organic certified seeds for seed companies. All right, so we have an awesome trio and I'm gonna turn it over to Amy to get us going. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks for having us and thanks for coming after lunch. I know it's been a long day and um, hopefully we can keep you awake uh, for our time together. Um, I just wanted to say I haven't been with Extension for 20 years. I've been in horticulture for 20 years, but only eight years of Extension experience. So I just wanted to wanted you to know that for some reason. Um, so the, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this whole project, how we got started on it, uh, a little bit about the whys, the hows, and, um, and a little bit about our results that we've been seeing in our trials for the past few years. And I'm so grateful to have these two with me. Thank you both for making the trek. 
So for the whys, um, when I first started my job with Extension, uh, a lot of people call into the Extension office and are asking questions like, I just moved on to this piece of property and I'm trying to figure out what to grow here. So in exploring cropping options and going over soil and water rights, a majority of the time, uh, the, the landowners I was speaking with were on land without water rights or limited water availability. And historically, Extension recommends pasture and grass, like, or you know, pasture or livestock on these um, types of soils. And I started meeting people who were doing a lot more than that on unirrigated land. So um, also um, with uh, reduced snow melt and uh, reduced availability of water in the summer, for example, in 2015, I'm not sure if the drought was as bad uh, up here in 2015, but a lot of people who were used to irrigating throughout the growing season, vegetable growers, had their irrigation cut off as early as June. So that was pretty terrifying. So it wasn't just the people on land without water rights that were interested in this topic. It was also um, the those who had historically had water rights and were used to irrigating, but then were kind of feeling like they couldn't really, they didn't really have that, they may not have that um, all the time in the future. So what, what do we do about that? Uh, and also many new farmers um, that are, don't come from farming families uh, have access to land that they're leasing oftentimes. And a lot of that land does not class one soil with water rights. So, uh, and, and also for the urban farmers, water is expensive. So we've had a lot of interest from um, gardeners and urban farmers as well because they're paying for that water. And um, so this is a topic of interest to them as well. Uh, so we covered the water scarcity topic, um, but there's other reasons that people are dry farming. So reduced inputs. Uh, so when you're not uh, installing an irrigation system, managing irrigation, oops, back. Um, repairing the pump, uh, and then managing weeds that you're irrigating, uh, you have less time inputs in theory. And there are some exceptions to that. So annual weeds are reduced when you're dry farming, but if you have bindweed or Canada thistle, uh, they don't mind dry farming. They'll, they'll still thrive in a dry farm system. So th that's uh, in theory. Uh, there are people like Teresa who don't have bindweed on their site, and um, so she has a lot less weeds, and she'll tell you more about that. But. Uh, another reason is improved uh, produce quality and storage. And I have up here, on um, the bottom here, you can see this website. Uh, Alex Stone uh, has done some research on winter squash, uh, irrigated and dry farmed, and then look at how, the Im how that impacts storage life. And has seen that some uh, types of winter squash that typically rot in storage by Thanksgiving will store on into March. Um, so, so that's uh, if you want to learn more about that, I, I won't be able to cover that in our short time together. But um, that's her website. And then also, at the, I have a picture here of this tasting table. So a lot of farmers have gotten customers excited about what they're growing by um, sampling out what dry farm produce tastes like. And, and a lot of people um, uh, report uh, improved uh, or increased, um, you know, it's more concentrated, differently, better texture, and longer storing. So even the tomatoes like, will, will sit around a lot longer than the irrigated ones. So niche marketing opportunity. Um, in a local needs assessment we did, so I'm based in the Southern Willamette Valley, uh, Corvallis area. Uh, we, in um, 2017, we uh, surveyed 252 farmers and 80% um, of them were interested in learning more about producing fruit and vegetable crops without irrigation. 64% uh, were on land without water rights or limited water availability. So then the other 46% were the people that had water but still interested in this. So, um, what are uh, so the 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 other the other reasons? What are they? So there was um, reports. Uh, you know, people were interested in uh, conserving water, and uh, like I mentioned, the improved quality and flavor. Um, and I'm asking you now, why are you here? Uh, maybe just take a couple of uh, people hands. Why are you interested in dry farming? We'd like to hear from you for a second. Oh, right over here. Okay. 
which crops grow in the areas with without water. Okay, we got one more. Yeah. That's, that's the case. A lot of um, the land, people are looking for land or new, newly on land are oftentimes uh, yeah, have the same, the same issue, water rights and that not being very common. And when it is there, it's very expensive. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I'm not going to have time to show this given our time constraints today, but there's a video um, that a Washington State um, colleague put together about our project and interviewed some farmers. So getting into, again, to the why, why, why are you interested in dry farming? And um, there's a link for that down at the bottom of the screen. And this presentation is being video recorded, so um, you can take pictures, but it also this will be available after the presentation. So what is dry farming? Um, so we're, we're talking about crop production during a dry season, usually in an area that receives 20 inches of annual rainfall or more. Uh, so like Western Washington and Western Oregon, Mediterranean-like climates, we're utilizing the residual moisture in the soil from our rainy season and using a suite of practices to conserve that water for summer crop growth. So um, we're going to be focusing on uh, crops that grow in the summer. Of course, there's a variety of things that we can grow in our area, like garlic and fava beans that you plant in the fall, can overwinter, and you don't really need to irrigate. But thus far in this project, we've focused on um, crops that typically grow in our dry season and um, what strategies work support growing uh, those crops without supplemental irrigation. Uh, this slide is a little hard to see since the, the color is yellow, but I just wanted to highlight that um, so Corvallis, Oregon is the same um, climate type as Monroe, Washington, and it's highlighted in these little yellow areas here. So we have a warm summer Mediterranean climate. We have these 40 plus inches of annual rainfall with the dry summers, and there's a lot of other areas in the world that have climates like this. So um, uh, here's Chile, which is really like a mirror image of the west coast of the United States. There's even like a um, a coast range like we have in Oregon and, a, and the Andes is like the Cascades and so there's a very similar, um, very similar climate and you can notice some other ones highlighted here. So I think there's a lot we can learn from other people that have light climates or other, um, other farmers and so forth that are growing in our light climate. And this is just a quick uh, snapshot here. So this is um, the average temp and precip for uh, Corvallis, Oregon, and we have Monroe right next to it. So we have temperature, and then we have um, precip here, and you can see we're pretty, pretty similar. And, uh, these graphs, graphs, by the way, came off the climate toolbox. So if you're lo located in another area, you can pull up your um, annual precip and rainfall, or look at other areas that you might be looking at land and getting. Uh, here in Yakima, which is a totally different climate than we have here and in Corvallis. So I just wanted to point out like Western uh, Oregon and Washington are very different, of course, than Eastern uh, Oregon and Washington. And what works for us here is going to be a lot different than what works for those folks there. Um, when I first started um, researching this topic, there wasn't a lot of information out there, but the resources I did find uh, were a few books by Steve Solomon, uh, Carol Deppie, uh, also David Granitstein, which is uh, WSU. He has a dryland farming in the Pacific Northwest, a non-technical overview, but that's mostly talking about grain crops in uh, inland, uh, so eastern Washington and Oregon, uh, which is a lot different than what we're talking about, which is vegetable crops in western uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, the California Agricultural Water Stewardship Initiative was another um, resource I stumbled across, and they have a whole page on dry farming. Uh, a lot of it is focused on wine grapes, um, but they do have some uh, resources there. And then from there, it kind of drops off. There's like early 1920s texts. Um, so John Widso, that, that's actually available online. Uh, kind of interesting to read that as well. But um, there, w there wasn't anybody currently working on this topic. I kept looking and thinking, surely there's somebody working on this. But um, there, wasn't, uh, there was a big gap in info there. 
So the work that we've done to date so far, um, we've done case studies in Western Oregon um, and Northern California. So um, I mentioned kind of um, uh, in my job encountering landowners that uh, are on land without water, but then I met a farmer in his 70s who had been dry farming a variety of fruit and vegetable crops for 40 years. He started in Northern California, and then he moved up to Veneta, Oregon, and I would visit him and document his practices once a month throughout the growing season. And then from there, I got connected to um, a nonprofit in California, and they connected me with six other dry farms down there. So I just went and visited with these farms in 2015, which ended up being a drought year and um, started uh, just kind of documenting what varieties, what practices they're using. Uh, the first time I did a demonstration was, uh, was in 2015 as well, and um, that ended up being the drought year. Like I said, uh, I had a field day. I waited to organize the field day until July, but um, we had a field day August 3rd. I expected maybe 20 or 30 people, and we had more than 100 people show up. And the most common question was, how many times did you irrigate? We're like, we didn't irrigate in the field. You know, the tomatoes were transplants and we irrigated in the greenhouse, but we didn't irrigate in the field. And people were just kind of, um, they thought they, they, they were, uh, had a hard time wrapping their heads around that. Um, so we did tastings at all these field days. Um, we've collected some preliminary data. A lot of our grant funding thus far has been for outreach and education. Uh, to raise awareness about these practices, and only recently have we started getting grant funding to fund some research. So we'll be sharing a little bit about what we've seen as our preliminary results, but um, we really are just uh, getting started on this topic. I think uh, in uh, university uh, systems, we've been uh, kind of concentrated on yield maximization strategies for a long time, and dry farming is an old way of farming, and it's not a yield maximization strategy. It's a way to produce food with less inputs. Um, so I think we've kind of lost touch with it for quite a while. So we're kind of trying to bring awareness uh, back about this topic and kind of demystify it. So uh, that's our work. So. Um, Let's see, uh, the, uh, I'm gonna get into the Dry Farming Collaborative in a minute, and um, some of our, our uh, grant-funded projects are uh, looking at site suitability, and then Lucas's work with fungal inoculants. So how does this all work? It really does start with the soil. Uh, the next presentation after this, we're gonna get into that a little bit more, uh, talking about some of these inherent soil um, properties and dynamic soil properties that support this type of farming or not. Um, but uh, clay, some clay content, uh, organic matter, having a deep soil, four inches, or I'm sorry, not four inches, four feet of soil or, or more is recommended by uh, Steve Solomon in his books. Um, site selection is also key. Um, plants as indicators, so when you look around in August and look where your uh, blackberries are still lush and green and plump and juicy, that might be an indicator that there's um, uh, the plants are still accessing water there late in the growing season. So there might be a high water table, but uh, those areas might be interesting to look at as a potential dry farming site. Um, the web soil survey, this is a snippet, uh, the farmer I mentioned that was in his 70s and had been dry farming for 40 years, this is his soil type. He's on a vanita loam. And the little parts that got, um, so this is from the web soil survey and the little highlights here, uh, mean annual precip, so 40 to 60 inches, so a lot of annual rainfall. Uh, when you look at the typical profile, um, you know, down below that first foot, there's uh, clay loam and clay, so uh, it's not a sandy soil or gravelly soil, uh, so there's good water holding capacity. It's certainly not a class one soil. I think it uh, was pretty abused when he started off on it, and he started doing cover cropping and rotational grazing. Um, but it is a deep soil, so, oops. So down here, depth to restrictive features, another interesting thing, he has uh, more than 80 inches, which is more than six feet of soil that he has for rooting capacity. Um, and depth to water table, too. So um, those are some different things um, that uh, you know, affect site suitability. Uh, soil preparation is also important, uh, starting early. Um, and that looks different on every site. So when you're able to get out there in the field to incorporate your cover crop or um, prep your seed bed, those kinds of things, starting early when there's still moisture. So planting uh, when and where there's uh, moisture. So uh, sometimes the soil surface looks dry, um, but then you dig down maybe two or three inches and there's moisture. So putting that seed in contact with, with where the moisture uh, starts 
and uh, pressing it in. A lot of practice, when I, followed, when I went and visited all those dry farmers, they're kind of pressing um, that seed in. Um, and that creates, uh, starts capillary action, bringing that moisture up to the surface. And um, a good illustration of that is mentioned by Steve Solomon in one of his books. It's like after you, uh, you see a, a field that has been uh, tilled and uh, it looks dry on the surface, but you walk across it and then you look back and your footprints are moist. So that's just an illustration of that capillary action that happens when you just compress right around the plant or seed, not all over the whole field. A lot of farmers will actually kind of hoe their way out of the field to kind of erase their footprints. Uh, so just a note, there's a lot of little nuances to this and a lot of people have um, techniques that they use that are, you know, that they uh, swear by and people have strong feelings about them, but there's a lot of ways to do this and people work with what they have. Um, Carol Deppie recommends uh, pre-soaking big seeded crops, so like the corn, the beans, the squash, pre-soaking those seeds uh, 24 hours before planting. Uh, some people say, oh, you don't need to do that. Um, but Carol recommends it, and we've done that and had good results. Um, we honestly, um, I won't get into this a lot, but have had better luck with transplants than direct seeding. I always, um, the same day I direct seed in the field, I plant back up um, ones in the greenhouse so I can plug in where there's gaps and there's always gaps. Um, so we, ha and, and also we have a short growing season, I think like, like most people in the room, um, our growing season is pretty short, so we wanna make sure our crops can reach maturity. Um, surface soil, so um, I think historically, uh, people have uh, referred to this technique as uh, dust mulching, um, which is really a kind of, uh, a, a lot of us are really passionate about soil quality and dust mulch sounds like a, you know the opposite of that. But it's really what organic farmers are already doing, which is cultivating rather than spraying herbicides for weeds and being more intentional about the timing of it. So after a rain event, when the soil uh, gets uh, crusted and, and starts cracking, uh, it would be loosening the surface. So if you're on a small farm, that might be with a wheel hoe. If you're on a larger farm, that might be with a tractor. But um, you don't want that crusting and cracking of the surface. So um, that has been called dust mulch, but I think we need a new word for that because the intention is um, definitely about soil quality, conserving that. Um, so uh, this is a picture up here uh, that Moria Peters did for one of our conferences, just kind of illustrating like the plants are planted when there's moisture, so they are tapping into that. And as the soil's drying down, those roots are following that down. Um, studying roots is really challenging, but we are all really curious to see how, how deep do these roots really go. Uh, so this is also another, an illustration she did to um, show the difference in this capillary action. So this is a coarse soil uh, with poor capillarity. It's hard for that water to move up that profile when compressed, um, but these uh, sandy or silty loams, excuse me, I need a drink of water, um, have better capillarity. Uh, so site assessment and selection. We've talked a little bit about um, the soil, the water holding capacity, and the depth. Uh, some other things to consider when uh, considering a site for dry farming is proximity to other plants, in particular trees. Tree roots can expand out quite a distance from um, where they're planted. So um, sometimes, you know, larger trees, you know, 50, 100 feet. So uh, that's important to consider. I've seen a lot of people really excited to participate and put their dry farm plot right next to a, a giant tree. And they know that it's not the right spot. They're excited to participate. But I wouldn't, you know, have high hopes about a spot that was, you know, 50 feet from a tree or 20 feet from a tree. Um, slope and aspect are something else to consider. You know, if you're on the north side of a slope or the south side of a slope, um, north side of the slope being um, uh, shadier. Um, also wind. So I have a friend that has a farm and got real excited to plant an orchard before they put a windbreak up and those trees just suffered. So um, wind increases evapotranspiration. Um, and then as I mentioned before, the plants as indicators. Crop and variety selection are also key. Um, so these are the crops I've typically seen grown um, in a dry farm setting, but I had not seen people dry farming lettuce or broccoli. Um, that being said, there are people who kind of take what you think, you know, like this list, and there's somebody in California that dry farms their carrots. 
and I, I, we haven't really tried that in our trials, but so there's always a, a, a person on a unique site or innovating in an interesting way that takes what you think are the, are the guidelines and then breaks them with their brilliance. So this is just a little snapshot of uh, Oak Creek. So um, this is where I've been doing a little demonstration about dry farming for the past three years. Uh, these uh, two treatments are irrigated and these two are dry farmed. So I'm just gonna show you that's uh, early June, July, notice they're pretty darn similar, and August. Um, so in that, in that year, um, we had two varieties of four different crops, uh, squash being one of them. And I just wanted to point out this variety effect. So Stella Blue is a variety that came from a dry farm plant breeder in Northern California. So Seed Revolution now is a place where we got some of our dry farm varieties. And um, you can see here that the red and the green are dry farmed, and then the blue and the purple are irrigated. So um, it, it had a higher yield, but it, anyway, there's a different response to irrigation. Um, so we saw that in, in all of our little demonstrations that there seemed to be more of a variety effect um, than a treatment effect. So, uh, so irrigated versus dry farmed not being uh, as big of an effect as, um, say, uh, Stella Blue versus Zeppelin Delicata. Uh, Dark Star Zucchini was another dry farm variety that stood out in our trials. So kind of noting this variety effect over and over. Um, and this is just a trial that we did in 2016, that same year at Gathering Together Farm. And this is an example of a site that had plenty of water rights. Um, when we were pulling this five foot soil core in this, uh, for this study, um, the water table was three feet below the soil surface. So when we planted those tomatoes a foot deep, um, those, those tomatoes were pretty darn close to accessing the water table. Um, this farm has no need to dry farm. They have plenty of senior water rights, but they started dry farming and expanding their dry farm crop production to uh, pursue this niche marketing opportunity. They were sampling this out at the farmer's market and the customers got excited about it. So um, just I wanted to point that out. This is a, that, that plot early, mid, and late season with no irrigation. Um, on that Oak Creek site, something that we did uh, last year, uh, we, we looked at dry farmed uh, versus irrigated and grafted versus ungrafted. Has anybody here grown grafted tomatoes? Okay, I've got one person. So some uh, farmers as a, um, as a strategy for managing disease are planting using um, grafting tomatoes, their favorite varieties, onto more vigorous, disease-resistant rootstocks. And people in the Dry Farming Collaborative wanted to understand, is there a difference, you know, when you dry farm versus irrigate grafted tomatoes? So just a quick snapshot of this is, here we have um, three different varieties. So um, Dirty Girl, by the way, is a dehybridized, dry farmed early girl, F5 generation. So um, it's been uh, selected for and dehybridized in a dry farm system. Then we have Early Girl and Perfect Rogue, were varieties that um, the Dry Farming Collaborative selected. And then, um, so we have dry farm, dry farm grafted. Something I want you to see here, so here's dry farmed, just standard, not grafted, and irrigated. So of course, irrigated tomatoes yield more. But when you look at, these are unirrigated grafted tomatoes, uh, they yield quite a bit more than the irrigated standards. And there's not a big difference between dry grafted and irrigated grafted. And so I wanna also mention that each one of these bars just represents five tomato plants. So this isn't like a large scale replicated trial, but this is definitely interesting and it would be an interesting project for somebody to do on a larger scale and replicate. So if you're considering tomatoes, you might consider trying grafted also. And another way to look at that here, we, um, we've been messing around with different ways to like share or illustrate data. Um, but these, so this is the harvest from one date, September 8th. It was that variety dirty girl. So here is the irrigated. These top two are irrigated. These top two are dry farmed. These are the grafted and these are the non-grafted. So you can kind of see that this um, dry farmed grafted uh, on, that, on that harvest date uh, yielded quite a bit more than the irrigated standard. So pretty interesting. 
So the Dry Farming Collaborative um, that we are all a part of, the people here with me today, we're a group of growers, extension educators, plant breeders, and ag professionals all partnering to increase knowledge and awareness of dry farming with a very hands-on participatory approach. So not, um, I'm not some isolated researcher researching dry farming and just showing up to conferences to share about it. Um, there's a whole network of people actively um, engaged and experimenting with this on their own land and with their own research projects. Um, so we initiated in 2016 with a Facebook group, and now we've grown to, on the Facebook group, we have more than 500 members. Um, the email list we use more for to like coordinate internally, like if you're hosting a dry farm trial, we add you to our email list so we can coordinate logistics of that. Um, we had 30 trial hosts in, 26 or 2017 and 2018, then this was I think the 2016 map. So we're, you can see we're kind of spread throughout Western Oregon, and the Organic Seed Alliance did do a zucchini trial with us in 2017. But we'd love to have more Was Washington participation. So um, we would love to this map. We would love this map to you know get larger and show some more hosts in um, Western Washington. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, so some of the data that we've collected in these um, preliminary trials is uh, we've done soil testing, pulled these five foot soil cores. Uh, traditionally, you know, we pull like one foot uh, soil cores, but in dry farming, what happens in that top foot isn't really that informative. It's really important to know what's happening um, down a little deeper because your crops are rooting a bit deeper in dry farming. Uh, we've collected some preliminary, preliminary yield uh, data. We've done sensory evaluations, started in soil moisture monitoring, and held multiple events. So we have a winter meeting coming up on January 30th at a to-be-determined location. Um, we have field days in the summer, usually August, September. Uh, we do tasting events and then presentations like this one today. And it's usually uh, me and then people I work with that are um, participating, like Lucas and Teresa. Uh, I'm not gonna get a lot into this since I think that my time is running out. Um, but this is kind of, we've done, taken this approach, we've designed um, the way that we've engaged in these trials to be inclusive of people on different scales. So there are um, some urban farmers and gardeners involved, and there's some people on, you know, 50 plus acres also involved in this project. So um, we've used, we've let the growers in the group decide what varieties that we're going we're gonna to grow. Um, a lot of them have uh, had a dry farm, a history of being dry farmed in some way. This is just a quick illustration of what the plot layout looked like for our plot last year. So this is all a variety trial. Each one of those initials rep represents a different variety. But what I want to show you here is like, this is what this um, plot could look like on your land or on a trial host's land. It's 100 square feet. And uh, if you did one replication of tomatoes, uh, that would be five to six tomato plants in 100 square feet. You could decide if you wanted to do 10 of those or just one of those or one variety or two varieties. We just look at like each farmer's um, plot as a replicate or as, a, um, as another rep, I think, of that variety, if that makes sense. I can answer questions after if that doesn't. These are the varieties that we included in our 2018 uh, replicated variety trials. And um, this is a quick snapshot that Lucas was kind enough to put together of us of our variety trial results. So um, we are still getting data in from our growers, um, but for 2018, this was one of our sites uh, near Corvallis. And um, uh, don't be overwhelmed here. This is like, so we have four different crops on the bottom. So you have beans, corn, squash, and tomatoes. And then each one of these boxes rep represents a different variety. So for beans, um, you can notice that this color right here has a higher yield, and that is Whipple. So Whipple was one of our highest yielding bean varieties in our, in our variety trials. And then for corn, we can see like this neon green color here is open oak dent corn that we got from adaptive seeds uh, at this site uh, yielded more than the others. And over here, we have Stella Blue, which was that dry farm squash that I showed you the graph of before, uh, was higher yielding than the other two varieties. And then here for the tomatoes, uh, Early Girl. It's, um, yeah, some people love Early Girl, some people hate it, but it consistently seems to do a little bit better in these trials than the other varieties we choose so far. We haven't, we've got a lot of work to do, but so far. So what's next? 
Um, I'm working on developing uh, the dry farming page on our website um, to be a hub uh, for information, because when I started on this, I had to look everywhere for this information, so I'm trying to aggregate that so everybody else doesn't have to look everywhere uh, for these resources. And then as we kind of um, get results in from our trials, I'm posting reports there. Um, and also I have an intro uh, to dry farming organic vegetable extension publication that is due to be released in February uh, or March, so in time hopefully for some people that want to uh, have that for planning for reference or to share with people. Uh, we're going to put together a variety trial report, um, continue to build this network. So this, this network is, there's a lot of uh, folks in our region, Western Washington and Oregon, involved in the Dry Farming Collaborative, but there's also people all over the country and people from other countries that are joining because they're Googling dry farming and um, they're joining in our Facebook group, for example, and sharing information about what they're doing in their part of the world. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a growing network here. So we're expanding our drought mitigation toolbox together. Um, coming up in 2019, um, we're going to be partnering in a solar farm vegetation study because they gave us some money. Um, I got a, um, I'm doing a deep leaf mulch trial alongside like a traditional cover cropped uh, area that I'll be incorporating and planting in. So looking at minimal and no till, starting to look at minimal and no till approaches compared to our conventional um, till, you know. Um, uh, tilled approaches. Uh, and then we're going to continue our site suitability study, and um, Lucas is also going to continue his fungal inoculant work that he'll tell you about more. Just some um, topics of interest. Uh, people, folks in the, in the Dry Farming Collaborative are interested in participatory plant breeding for dry farm systems, since these dry farm varieties have um, stood out in a lot of ways. Um, we're interested in having more of those varieties available and developing those for our, our particular areas. Uh, dry farmed orchard systems is another topic of interest. Uh, hugel culture, which is these like wood, does anybody know what hugel culture is? Heard about it? Yeah, so buried wood that rots in ground over time and then planting a garden bed on top of that. So um, that'd be a really interesting research project. If you know anybody who wants to do that, let me know. Um, different types of mulching. So some farmers um, that have bindweed pressure have put down weed fabric and dry farm that way. Uh, I'm doing the leaf mulch this year. Uh, I know of other people that have been doing, had access to wood chips. So um, minimal and no-till approaches uh, for organic farmers. We, there's a lot of organic farmers involved in the Dry Farming Collaborative. We're not exclusively organic, but um, most, of it, most of the people involved or that have shown interest so far are doing, are doing organic farming in some way. I uh, just want to point this out. Um, this is our website, uh, which I'll put up at the very end as well. Uh, so we have a resource page where we have um, some handouts. This is where the extension pub will be once I um, put it out there, and I'll announce it on our Facebook group as well. But if you want to see um, these variety trial, these different reports that we put together, it shows everything we did from you know, when we flail mode the cover crop, uh, what we, you know, the kind of the order of operations in the field, the results we saw. So I just wanted to make sure that you know this is there, because I can't cover it all. And with that, I'd love to hand it off to Teresa Retzlaff of 46 North Farm. She's been involved with this project from the beginning, and uh, she uh, has always referred to herself as the outlier, because she's up on the north coast and we're down in the valley. But thank you, Teresa. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much. I just realized I'm wearing the same shirt in that photo. Clearly, it's my going to town fancy shirt. Um, <laughs> um, so I got, so our, our farm is about nine miles east of Astoria, um, right at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, we're on 18 acres, and the property is kind of a big rectangle, and sort of at either end of it, we have a nice patch of a silt loam soil that's on top of a really thick bed of clay. And in the middle of the farm is, is basically a big wetland um, clay pasture. So um, up near our house, the, the, the farming that we started up there and that patch of nice soil 
Hill does have access to water. They, there's a well on the property, but it's a shallow well, and it's really a remnant from before the area um, built, designed a community water system and tapped into water coming out from Astoria. So we knew when we started farming on this property that we would at least have access to some city water to get us started. And then the idea was we were working at the time with the NRCS on sort of multiple projects. We needed to put in elk fencing because we have herds of elk that come through the property. Um, and we wanted to build a high tunnel. And then kind of the third step in that infrastructure project was going to be irrigation, and especially getting irrigation back to this really nice piece of land that was, of course, farthest away from the house and farthest away from the irrigation. It's where it's nice and flat and beautiful and the best soil. And for various reasons, um, you know, uh, agents leaving and priorities changing in regional offices, that irrigation project fell through. So I was left in 2014 with about an acre of beautifully fenced in land with a high tunnel where I had planted out um, tomatoes and peppers. And at that time we were irrigating it with a, a 250 gallon tank of water that, on a trailer that we were driving back there to demonstrate that, you know, it wasn't efficient irrigation. And um, and I knew that there's just no way I could water this whole area. It was, it was as terrible as it sounds. It was just really not a fun experience. And my husband will tell you that I destroyed the clutch of our truck learning how to back up a trailer. Um, so I was kind of uh, at, at, at a loose end. And I heard about Amy and her dry farming experiment through some, some people I knew at OSU Small Farms Program. And I just figured, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I, I'd heard about dry farming. I had experimented with dry farming potatoes. Um, but I will be honest with you, I mean, I didn't really understand what dry farming meant at the time. And and pretty much I just planted my t potatoes and didn't irrigate them and called it dry farming. And so the first year I had a really great crop. I, this is amazing. I'm like, I've totally got this dry farming thing down. And then the second year it was just a total crop failure. And I, you know, I, I, you know, I thought there might be some reasons that I could understand why, but I didn't really get it. And um, so when the opportunity to join this dry farming collaborative um, came up, I was like, absolutely sign me up. And so the first year um, at our farm we grew three crops. We grew we grew the dark star zucchini, we grew a yellow fin potato, and we grew a delicata squash called Zeppelin. And it was it was just kind of a crazy, I couldn't believe that I was putting these plants in the ground and then I was gonna walk away and I was gonna never water them again. And I kind of really didn't believe that this was gonna work. And when I went to one of the, the first presentations at the Small Farms Conference, there was this old, old guy, um, Bill, and people were asking him, like, how do you know when to plant? And he was like, well, you know, you need one of those clear mornings where there's kind of a mist on the ground and it's sort of like there's moisture in the air, but not too much. And we were all looking at each other like, what the hell is he talking about? I don't know. But I, you start to figure it out after a while. You kind of do. I mean, it's weird and I can't tell you what the right day is at your farm, but I'm starting to know when the right day is on my farm. So that first year, kind of mind blowing, especially the zucchini. I will, I will tell you this, I will never grow irrigated zucchini again, and I don't know why anyone would ever irrigate the zucchini. The, this variety, especially Dark Star, off the charts, productive. I didn't notice any difference in production. The quality was fantastic. The flavor was great. My chefs loved it because it was so firm, and they could grill it. They could do anything to it. And it, I mean, and it stores a really long time, too. It's, I never thought I would be this excited about zucchini, but I am excited about that zucchini. So the second year, I decided, OK, I'm going big into dry farming. I wanted to totally expand. And this year, the collaborative also got a lot more um, regulated. This is the year that we started to establish that you know 100 square foot is a replication. And so I got really particular, and I marked out all my rows. And so our rows are four feet wide and 100 feet long. So each of my rows is four replications. And I did a bunch of winter squash. I did um, some dry shelling beans some tomatoes as well. And the dry beans, I got to so I do everything from transplants because my growing season is so short. But the dry beans, you, you direct seed them. There's no other way it's going to be economically viable. And that was the most kind of leap of faith moment for me. I could not believe that I was going to dig this trench. And I just like, for like superstition, I just pour a little like bead of water down the trench, a little blessing. And then I planted all my seed and I covered it up and I walked away. And I'm like, there's no way this is going to work. And it totally worked. It totally worked. They grew. I mean, when they germinated, I just was freaking out. I can't believe it. I've got beans growing. And then they they totally produced. And it was amazing. I, it just is kind of mind blowing. No, and no irrigation. I didn't water these at all. And we do. So we probably, after we plant the first, we probably hoe those couple of months 
maybe two or three times, just to kind of stay on top of the weeds, stay on top of the things that are germinating. But at a certain point in the summer, I pretty much don't have to weed at all because there's no more weeds germinating, or there's just one or two that you can pull out as you're, as you're harvesting. So year two was amazing, but I definitely had some things, like the winter squash didn't do so great for me, and I was thinking it was a really wet spring, they got planted a little bit late, I wasn't sure why, wasn't super excited about that, but I thought maybe they just don't like being dry farmed. So then this last year it was kind of exciting because a lot of researchers got involved and I participated in two trials. One of them was Lucas's trial, which was super cool. And then also um, the winter squash people were doing this test and sh she came to our winter farm meeting um, and presented about like asking if we wanted to do this and said that what they were gonna do is come out and, and plant the plants and they were gonna install these moisture sensors at different depths. And then we were gonna be given this aerometer, this, this pretty high-end little piece of equipment um, that we would take weekly readings on and, and you know, the data of like how moist the soil was at different depths. And then at the end of the season, we would get to keep it. And I was like, sign me up for that. It's a thousand dollar piece of equipment. And it's a little shameless to say that's why I did it, but I got so much out of that. It was amazing. And it actually really transformed how I water. So in our, in our greenhouse, our hoop house, which is you can see how close it is to our dry farming plot. It's right next door, and that's where we have um, tomatoes and peppers in there. And this year, I was standing there taking my moisture reading and, and looking at this thing and seeing, like, my soil is basically fully saturated. And I kind of looked over there, and like 30 feet over there is my hoop house with my cherry tomatoes in there. And I, it was a really hot day in July, and I'm thinking I, that I was going to need to go over and water there. And I'm like, I don't think they need to get watered. And I irrigated my tomatoes in my hoop house twice this season. And that was it, and it was the best crop I've ever had. I had hardly any splits, they tasted great, they grew like gangbusters. And it made me realize that I've probably been watering them too much, but I just didn't realize how much they were accessing the soil, how much they were accessing the moisture deep down in the soil. So that was kind of mind blowing. And then the other thing that I found was with our winter squash, um, in this, basically in the same area that we, we grew it last year, because I only had a limited spot, I ended up growing winter squash in those beds, but the difference was that the winter of 2017, we sowed cover crop. You know, I limed the soil, I had sown cover crop, which I hadn't done the year before, and the plants responded like crazy. And I want to show you my final slide, um, because this is the same bed. So we, we extended out two more rows in 2018, this is essentially the same bed at the same time of year. And the main difference is that this year, it, the soil was just what more well amended. You know, I'd grown a cover crop. I'd tilled in some all-purpose fertilizer more. I'd added more lime. And it really helped me understand that sometimes when we think about plants being stressed in a, in a you're growing them in a dry farming situation, in 2017, I was looking at those plants and thinking, oh, the reason they're not producing well is because I'm dry farming them. It's because they're thirsty. And I realized, no, it's because they're hungry and they just need more nutrients in the soil. So my focus now is really working on building my soil and building up my soil nutrients and realizing that the plants, if you have the right soil profile, the plants are, are gonna find the water. It's down there and they're pretty smart and they know how to take care of themselves. And you just kind of have to get out of the way. Um, this is a really exciting project. I mean, I, I will not even begin to say that I really know what I'm doing. I still feel like I'm kind of stumbling around in the dark and just discovering these things, but it's very cool to be part of this project. And, um, I, you know, I'm excited for the future for this. It, it is also amazing to not have to put out irrigation. I don't have to, I'm not spending any money on drip tape. I'm not looking for holes in it. I'm not throwing it away when it's broken. And it's so much less effort and time. I mean, it's crazy how much more efficient this is. And the yield, you know, honestly, I don't know that it's really that much less. It's, it's less for some things, but some things it's not. And so, so I think it's partly just understanding what's gonna work on your farm. What works on my farm might not work on yours. So it also forces you, and this is the thing that I was talking to Lucas about, participating in these scientific projects this year also really, um, encouraged me to, to observe in a way that I don't think I was really observing on my farm and I was paying attention in a way that I think it's easy to walk past because you think you just don't have enough time to pay attention and I've learned some things about farming my piece of land that are pretty eye-opening and 
um, I really encourage you to try that and, and participate. So thanks so much. And um, yeah, we'll be around to ask, answer questions afterwards if you have any. So I think Lucas is going to step up and talk about the cool project he did. Thank you, Teresa. Oh. Great. Great, thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. And um, yeah, I am, I'm very grateful for Amy, Amy Garrett for um, organizing the Dry Farming Collaborative. I'm coming at it as a more of a more of an academic. I have a, a background studying agronomy and particularly the role of microorganisms in in uh, our agriculture. And uh, so I came at it with that angle, and um, I I went with to the USDA and and pitched a project called Engaging with the Dry Farming Collaborative for fundamental and applied research on endophyte mediated drought tolerance in diverse crops. So. This is my first year doing this uh, this particular research project with the Dry Farming Collaborative, although I've been uh, loosely involved with the Dry Farming Collaborative for the past uh, couple years. And so in addition to Amy, I'm working with Posey Busby, um, who studies um, plant-associated microbes in OSU plant pathology. So um, one of the interesting things about plants is that they're not just plants, and same same with people and and uh, other macroorganisms is that we're essentially ecosystems in which uh, microorganisms exist, and um, we're in a lot of ways um, made up uh, and benefit uh, by these microorganisms and. Um, a lot of us have heard of microorganisms being used in plants there's the famous uh, root nodules and uh, mycorrhizae, and so these root-associated uh, bacteria and fungi. Um, but there's also uh, endophytes, which are microorganisms that <laughs> I don't know what that was. Uh, microorganisms that live entirely inside the plant. They're uh, embedded within plant tissues, and so. Um, and they don't cause disease. And so there's certain known benefits um, that endophytes can confer for agriculture. A big one I'm gonna focus on today is, is stress tolerance, uh, including heat, drought, cold, and uh, salt growing plants in saline soils, also with the nutrient acquisition. Um, this is an illustration uh, of what they look like. These are actually uh, microscope pictures. People are able to dye the, the bacteria and fungi uh, in green, and this is them just hanging out in the vascular system of, of plants. Um, uh, they can grow through plant tissues, uh, and this is uh, bacteria and fung fungi and seeds. They're also inherited in, in seeds. So pretty interesting. Uh, uh, so with a m microbial ecology background, I became familiar with this concept of habitat-adapted symbiosis, which is a fancy way of saying that in order to survive in some extreme environments, plants can take up uh, bacteria or fungi that benefit them in those environments. And so um, this research was pioneered by uh, doctors Rusty Rodriguez and Regina Redmond. They went to extreme environments, they took these plants, they isolated fungi out of them and found that without these fungi, these plants would not be able to survive in um, a thermal soil or um, in a dry environment. So um, they qu quickly found that these fungi, um, these endophyte fungi were able to confer certain stress tolerance in our crops. So. Uh, there's some examples of uh, saline tolerance and drought tolerance um, being enhanced in, uh, you know, wheat, gra uh, rice. I guess is this one on top, and also uh, tomato. So this seems like a a very um, ancient symbi symbiotic partnership that can be utilized across many different kinds of plants. So they developed a product, and now they have a product called BioInsure. Uh, uses a particular fungus called Trichoderma harzianum, and they are starting to market this product. And so my idea for this last year was just to test it within the Dry Farming Collaborative to see if these endophytes might benefit these plants who we, we imagine the plants are 
there's, you know, yield is impacted by how much stress plants are going through in the in the in the growing season, and um, there's a lot of consideration on choosing the right plant variety because they are able to deal with stress, but perhaps yield can be increased with these endophytes. And so it integrated really nicely into the variety trials already going on. We, we essentially uh, inoculated the seeds with this fungus, um, some of the seeds in, the, in these varieties, and sent it out to uh, different growers as well as growing it ourselves. And so I'm also with Moondog's Farm, and here's a, a bird's eye picture of Moondog's Farm. We're outside of uh, Eugene, Oregon, in a small, near a small town called Marcola. Uh, this is a colleague, Dan Schuler, who uh, began a, a dry farm apple orchard. So uh, it was a fun experiment. You'll see in these rows, we have these dry farm squash. So in the alleys between the, the uh, the apple seedlings, we just started it this last year. We have some, some annual crops that we're dry farming. And so this whole big field, um, we see these, these darker dots are actually the annual crops in between trees that were planted. And this is the second year that we've been involved in the research. Um, the first year we planted here um, and had pretty uh, bad results. And then we took soil cores from here and also across the farm and found that the soil was a lot uh, less deep, it was a lot shallower here uh, um, than it was here, and this year we had a lot better results, so that illustrates how it's beneficial to have um, large, or to, to have, to take a really good look at your soil and see what works best. Um, this is also we, I, one of the other field sites that we had at uh, Corvallis, the OSU Vegetable Research Farm. So we replicated beans, tomatoes, squash, and corn, uh, inoculated with the fungus or not inoculated. And again, it was, we had, we have had replication across different sites with dry farming participants who received uh, inoculated seeds or not inoculated seeds of particular varieties that they are interested in. So uh, we're just starting to get preliminary results. Um, here's just a picture of our seed inoculation device. I won't get into that. Um, we also didn't inoculate tomato seeds, but we inoculated seedlings. Um, here's just an interesting picture of how they inoculated tomato seedlings. They were actually kind of stunted, um, but that didn't pan out in how they yielded. It was just kind of interesting how the plants responded to the inoculant. Um, so this is a kind of a busy graph, but the take home message is that um, so far we're still getting data, but the inoculation seems to be um, really dependent on the crop, the crop variety, and the site in which the crop grows on. This is a, just an example of dry beans. So on the y-axis we have yield, and there's three different sites, Moondogs, uh, Peoria, Vegetable Research Farm, and you see uh, the, there's varieties, the crop, the bean varieties are on um, each of these. And basically, the inoc we're looking at the, the red versus the, the blue in terms of the red being not inoculated control and the blue being inoculated. And in this case, you know, the Warwick bean yielded, the inoculants yielded less, um, but um, the Whipple bean, the inoculant yielded more. And we're finding that certain varieties in certain sites uh, responded positively and certain ones didn't respond at all or maybe even kind of negatively. So. It's, it's a complex question once you're dealing with biology. So in, in light of time, I want to just end with some, some uh, food for thought. Uh, so there, there's some, like I said, there's complex interactions, potentially with plant genetics, microorganisms that are already existing in the plant, uh, side effects, um, including how much stress the plants are undergoing in a particular site. If there's not a lot of stress on the site, then the inoculant isn't really going to be helpful. It only helps when the plants are stressed. It helps them deal with stress. Um, ensuring that the inoculants actually take hold in the plants is another consideration. And uh, these plants are already drought hardy, so we might be not necessarily going to benefit with their, uh, by inoculating them. Um, also, we can improve our chances by using more strains of this particular fungus or even 
using other inoculants in conjunction with it, including biofertilizers. Um, and then also, it's interesting to note that potentially these drought hardy plant varieties have their own endophytes that are allowing them to survive in these local environments. So um, we're working to develop localized inoculants um, using particular fungi that we get from the Dry Farming Collaborative. So that's all I have. Yeah. And so how much time do we have for questions? I just want to put up our kind of closing slide here. So if you're new to dry farming, we recommend starting with a site that has deep soil, good water holding characteristics, starts very small, just like I did. I, we all started very small and expanded on our successes. And then uh, join, uh, join in our group. I mean, the Facebook group is a good window in to what's happening uh, with all these people experimenting with dry farming. And if you want to host a trial, you can join our email list. And there's uh, contact info. Um, should we invite questions up to microphone so that they can be recorded? We'll just repeat it. Okay. Um, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Can you talk a little bit about how you go about preparing the soil for this dry farming? Like, what changes? Like, you said 14 feet. Are you excavating that? The soil is not 14 feet. Oh, no, no. So, so in selecting a site, it's good to have a deep soil that's at least four feet deep. In prepping the soil, we cover crop. Um, or add organic matter, so organic mat uh, matter addition, cover cropping are good, and that looks different on different farms. Um, so I, in the past at the Oak Creek site, for example, we have cover cropped uh, and added compost because it had really low organic matter initially, had very acid soil, so to grow vegetables we also amended with lime. Uh, we flail mowed our cover crop uh, and then incorporated it once it was dry, uh, enough to do so. Uh, and then kind of danced with the rain until it was uh, we could prep a seed bed to plant. And then after planting, it's about not letting the soil crust and crack after, after those spring rain events and going through and cultivating. Uh, so you don't want weeds, obviously. You're, you're designing around your limiting factor, which is water. So you don't want the weeds competing with you, and you don't want your soil crusting and cracking because those cracks cause the soil to dry out faster. Um, anything that you all want to add to? I would just also add that, um, and I th I'm pretty sure there's a handout on the dry farming um, resource page. You're, you're spacing your plants a lot further apart. You're planting way fewer plants than you would normally plant if you were irrigating. And so that's something to kind of get your head around. But since that plant, the only moisture that it has to access is what's in the soil, you don't want there to be as much competition. So there's some recommended spacings that we've been given. So for like a, a, a 100 square foot plot, of uh, squash, you plant three plants, you know, so in a 25 foot section of, I have three plants there. And I'm experimenting with different densities and stuff like that, but officially it's, it's much less dense. But um, so it's a combination of you're prepping the soil properly and trying to not let the moisture escape, but then also planting um, less densely. Anything you wanna add? Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, she's asking about what about uh, fall or overwinter. Um, there's a lot of crops that work really well in our area for um, overwintering and get plenty of rain. Uh, we haven't focused on that in our project, but garlic, fava beans, brassicas, many greens, I think those are kind of more standard. Uh, it, like people often grow those without irrigation. So we've been focusing on the ones that, but those, so yeah, there's a long list of crops I think that overwinter well that can be fall planted and harvested in spring, but we haven't focused on those in this project. We're kind of looking at the more difficult ones. Uh, in the back. Is the yield worth it? Uh, so I think that's a very personal question. I mean, um, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, it, it is in some crops and not in others. I think that um, the plants can be pretty productive, and um, I, I'm trying to do some comparisons of irrigated versus not irrigated, but it's hard to do them side by side or in the same situation. So sometimes it's hard to really determine, am I getting more yield or less yield? 
What I'm also weighing it against is the less of input and resources. So on the one hand, if you're just looking at yield as like this is what the only thing I'm measuring, but I'm also measuring how much less water I'm using, I'm measuring how much less time I'm putting into those beds, how much less resource I'm having to put in there, um, not having to do the irrigation, not having to pay for irrigation parts. And so when I'm looking at overall farm profitability, um, a lot of the dry farming crops are starting to look pretty appealing to me just because it's so much less effort and I can spend that time that I would be spending managing those crops or weeding or doing something else focusing on other crops that I am irrigating. So I, I mean it's kind of hard to say and I think the hard thing too when you're starting out is you know you, you may have some areas where there's less yield or your yield really drops and so I wouldn't just switch your whole farm over to dry farming in a season. I definitely would start small and get your technique down and kind of understand how it works. That first year, I felt like I was flailing and I did not know what I was doing. It was very accidental if I had any excess success at all. But now I'm starting to feel like, okay, I kind of get this. I kind of understand what I need to do to make this work. And I'm really focusing on increasing yield through fertility. So it, it's a hard question to answer exactly, but it, it can be worth it. Um, I don't have data about like how much less yield you get. And quite frankly, with that zucchini, I don't think I'm getting any less yield at all. I still get monster zucchinis all the time. It'd be an awesome project for somebody to do economic analysis on, on this whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, she's asking if all the sites are in floodplain areas, and no, we have quite a diversity of sites, and um, uh, we'll be compiling, we had 30 different trial sites, and I say they were on a very diverse, a lot of them in the valley, which are valley, you know, valley soils, but uh, some people that were kind of more in the foothills, and uh, some even kind of on the edge of, uh, like there was one in Terrebonne, Oregon, which is pretty dry, that, uh, and, and we couldn't even pull a five foot soil core there. I think they only got two and a half or three feet. So um, we're trying to look at like kind of what are the edges of this, like not just let's pick the best sites and trial there. We kind of want to understand what sites don't work and what sites do work. So we're trying to have a diversity. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that next session. Uh, do our best to it without the, with the absence of our speakers. That is, yeah. I just wanted to say too, and she, when she's saying that you're, you should have four feet of soil, I don't have four feet of soil, and it's working just fine for me. So I mean, there may be like optimum situations, but I don't want to scare you off from trying this if you don't have the perfect site or the ideal site. If you're on sandy soil, this would be hard. But if you have some clay and, and moisture holding capacity, um, I, I think there's potential there to try it. So, so you're asking about having silt loam on top of a layer of clay. That's pretty much what I have. I think I have about two and a half feet of a silt loam, and then it's a pretty abrupt transition to a clay that I've been told I could make some really nice pots out of. Um, it's, it's very dense, and my water table is pretty high. So in the winter, I definitely will have standing water after a really heavy rainfall. Um, it, it seems to be working for me. Um, there seems to be enough nutrient going on in those, and that's that's where I'm just like working to build those topsoils to make them as as rich as possible. But then I think what the cool thing for me is I've got this this bank of water down there that the plants can reach. It, it's it, no, it's I mean the whole the area it's it's pretty flat. It's a little bit of a slope, so there's some sections of my area that's a little bit wetter than others. And honestly, I find the wetter sections the plants don't do as well. Um, but it, it's it's pretty uniform across the area that I'm growing in. And I wouldn't say that wet soils are better necessarily, like super wet soils. We're still figuring that out. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. I think we've only begun to start to answer that question by this first year having these 30 sites and planting some of the same varieties across these sites and then we'll do that again, you know, and then I think we'll start being able to tell that story better. Yeah? So 
Um, so there's some gardeners that are experimenting with mulches. Uh, commercial farmers that are, um, you know, working with tractors um, are not doing that. Um, just like what, like I mentioned, like organic farmers are already kind of cultivating instead of spraying their weeds. So just being more intentional about the timing. Uh, I'm do, we're doing, some people are doing deep leaf mulch kind of in a garden scale. Um, uh, some people with high weed pressure. I showed a picture of um, weed fabrics. A guy that has a lot of bindweed pressure on his field in southern Oregon uh, started using weed fabric and then poking holes in that uh, to plant melons because uh, the bindweed was just out of control. So people are trying different things. There's really not one cookie cutter approach and what works on one site may not work on another. Uh, so I think we're really kind of developing a toolbox, a suite of options to kind of pull from and then you can select what works for you because we're all on such unique sites. Uh, everybody has different equipment available, so there's not really like a, uh, this is the way to do it. Um, the guy that's been dry farming for 40 years has two implements. He has a chisel and a tiller. So he works uh, with those two implements solely, uh, but people really kind of make uh, use of what they have. And some people are, um, you know, have a BCS uh, tiller, uh, yeah, and then a uh, wheel hoe, uh, Teresa or yeah. Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. We, we use a BCS to flail mower our cover crop and then a tiller. And then I've also experimented with doing some broad forking and just running like a, a very light kind of uh, Johnny's makes this tilther tool. I love that tool. Um, and then we used to use a stirrup hoe to weed. So it's a bit of work. It's a good workout, but um, it goes pretty fast. Yeah, at Moondog's Farm, we, we sort of hire, hire out um, some kind of deep, deep cultivation. And I, I just want to note that like, you know, uh, a lot of nutrients are uh, tend to stay on the top, on the su surface of the soil, but the water soon leaves that. So it's probably a good idea in dry farming to try to get the fertility down there, and sometimes that includes cultivating lower. And also, root penetration is a big deal. If you have a lot of clay, clay holds on the moisture really well, but roots might not be able to penetrate down as well. Um, so, but yeah, we usually do um, like a, a deep a deep till and then some kind of surface tillage to like cultivate the weeds, yeah. yeah. And um, Teresa mentioned the broad fork. So on a garden scale, broad fork to kind of break that hard pan. Uh, but if you have a tractor and a chisel, we use a chisel. We'll kind of like put our amendments on and then go through the chisel so that that compost can kind of drop down a little lower than it would if you just incorporated it with the tiller, for example. All right, we good? All right, thank you all. Thank you.